Please welcome Nordic TB Collective co-founders Lola Akimade Okerstrom and Janika Hansen, as well as Intrepid Group Managing Director Ian Ye, Zina Benchik, in conversation with Skift Global Tourism reporter Rosie Spinks. Hi, everyone, and um, thank you so much, Lola, Zina, and Janneke, for being with us today. I'm just going to briefly introduce you guys again. Lola and Janneke are co-founders of Nordic TV, uh, which is a collective of digital storytellers, which works with travel brands and destinations in the Nordic countries. Lola is also a photographer, writer, and editor whose work has appeared in National Geographic, The New York Times, and a really impressive list of other places. And Zina, who is joining us at uh, Skipped Forum Europe for the second year in a row, is the Managing Director uh, for Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa for Intrepid Travel, uh, which is the world's largest small group adventure travel company. So I'm really excited for this chat we're gonna have today. Um, I like to start these things big picture. <laughs> we're at an incredibly tumultuous time in the world and in tourism and travel and in pretty much every way you can imagine. So I, I wanna talk about how stories can serve as a crisis response um, because that seems to be more relevant than ever. Uh, Lola, do you, maybe do you wanna start? Absolutely. So I always say people connect with people, not companies, right? And so in a time of crisis, especially what has happened recently, people are looking to companies that are vulnerable that are honest, that are transparent, that acknowledge publicly that we are going through a crisis as well. And so the way a company kind of pivots to storytelling to show that I see you, I recognize what you're going through, and we're also going through this and being honest about it, I think that's how companies can start kind of building loyalty during a time of crisis to show that we're all in this together. Mm, yeah, definitely. And it, it seems like Intrepid kind of did that in in the last few months, Zina. Do you wanna do you wanna speak a little bit about that? Yeah, completely. I guess storytelling has already uh, been has always been key to us as a business, and in this crisis, even we've seen even more the importance of it. Uh, as as Lola mentioned, when we started, we've, we entered this crisis. We really looked at ways to uh, connect with our people and our audience, and give them a platform to connect with each other as well. So what we've done when we really entered this isolation period where people couldn't travel, uh, instead of uh, you know uh, advertising new destinations and new places to go, which wasn't really realistic thing to do at that time, was to give them access to our platform. And we've launched a, what we call the Be Together campaign and give them access to these platforms to really share their stories of travel, uh, what they learn when they travel, who they meet when they travel, what are the experiences that really change their, their mind when they travel with us. Um, and this was really an exchange of letters from a traveler to another traveler, from a traveler to a tour leader, from a tour leader to another traveler. It, I know Lola has actually shared one of her amazing story uh, in Uzbekistan in one of our intrepid tour and and each of these letters really have increased our engagement with our audience more and more one after the other so that was a pretty um, unique way for us to reconnect people together with our brand and with with them um, as um, as a community right and you know one of the things that's been most interesting about covering the tourism industry during this time is is watching companies try and find the right tone for their stories right now you know historically the travel industry is offering this story of escape and adventure but it's just not possible right now so Janneke, maybe you can speak to this how um how have you seen brands navigate that i'm sure you've seen some ones that have done it well some ones that haven't you don't have to name names but i'm just curious yeah. any general impressions on that kind of that question of finding the right tone in a crisis yeah i, I think the communication now during the crisis has been like walking in a minefield mm -hmm. so it's been a little bit like you can do this you cannot do that or you can communicate certain uh, like you can inspire people to to uh, explore their own neighborhood but not the the next door region or you know so it has been really difficult and it's all been about timing so the mm -hmm. timing of when you put the message out has been really really important to, to how people has has uh, taken it and and so the stories that they are telling like um, i've been on a, a huge road trip now uh, all, all over uh, norway uh, for five mm -hmm. weeks 
and I've been talking to a lot of the local uh, DMOs, um, the regions, and, and how they now are shifting their communication towards mm. local tourism, towards uh, domestic travel instead of international travel. And a lot of the smaller companies has really a strong um, voice internationally, but towards the domestic travel uh, or the domestic market, they don't have a clue of how what stories to tell or what uh, what kind of product they want to offer because it's totally different. The product that you want to offer to the locals the discovering their own neighborhood and mm -hmm. it's the, the, the products that you want to offer to international visitors. So it's a really it's a really a tough time and um, mm -hmm. trying to navigate through all the the minds that are potentially there and and uh, getting the right story. Yeah, I, I want to talk a little bit more about this idea of local um, stories. Uh, Lola, I know this is something that you you've sort of seen reflected in in your work as um, with Nordic TV and as a writer and photographer. Do you want to talk about that a little? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things and one of the strengths of being a local storyteller is because you have deeper access, deeper insight into your community. A lot of destinations, which is all right, a lot of destinations keep bringing in kind of international storytellers to tell their story to the world. Mm -hmm. And yes, you do need sometimes a fresh pair of eyes to share your story, but then you forget the strong storytellers in your background. Mm -hmm. And in your backyard, the storytellers can, that could actually be your local natural ambassadors, right? To strengthen your brand image as well. So I think now is a time for brands, especially as it's gonna take a while for travel to reopen, so start looking at the storytellers in their backyard and how they can leverage them to say, look, this is what's going on. This is how we are slowly adjusting to the new normal and then leveraging those voices to help tell the stories and strengthen the local brand image internationally as well. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think people will be surprised if they actually knew how little people actually know about their local community and their local, uh, um, like what you can really experience in your own neighborhood. Uh, because it's not being communicated and we are not encouraged to discover our own region or our own country. So so, so the, the, especially the national DMOs or the national tourism boards mm -hmm. are really determined on only international communication. Mm -hmm. So it's such a new thing that they have to turn around the way they think. Because we think we know everything about our local community. We don't. Mm -hmm. Like, it's such a surprise. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Zina, I know Intrepid has launched um, something along these lines. Do you want to speak a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So Intrepid has been 31 years a global leader in local experiences, but we've always offered these experiences for people to uh, experience far away from home. So it would be an Australian going to Vietnam, an Australian going to Morocco, a British person going to Peru, and um, everything we would, you know, really experience local. But as you just mentioned, um, it's... Um, We've never really thought of how can we offer the same type of experiences, but around the you know our neighborhoods where we live. And um, so what we've done is really we've entered the period where we start to think of what would our community, our audience, our customers will look for if they would go on an intrepid tour, but in their own backyard and in their own neighborhood. What is what is the really value added of intrepid? And we thought of a local leader, an immersive experience, a responsible travel manner, um, a local, a positive impact on the local community, and all of these things that make Intrepid trips really unique. And we design those local experiences, keeping in mind these different things. And so we, we've launched a couple of weeks ago a range of, um, it's a brand new theme for us, which is called Intrepid Local Retreats. And those are trips around Australia, around the UK, around Europe, around uh, North America that are really designed for people from these different markets to experience their own uh, you know, backyard, but in an intrepid way and shorter land, center base that you can really sometimes just drive to, to reach and have you know, this experience that is delivered by the local leader, which is really unique to our type of travels and, and all of these things. So we've had a really positive uh, um, feedback from um, what we've, uh, uh, from since we've launched this new uh, range and we've already seen some great bookings, which is it shows that there is a there is a need for that and we're really happy that we kind of got it right in, in how we designed the, this concept yeah absolutely 
So we're talking in this session about, about storytelling and how brands um, need to and do use it to respond to the moment. And of course, another one of the things that's happened in this extraordinary time that we're all living through um, are the Black Lives Matter protests, of course, that started in the US and then kind of reverberated across the world, including and especially in, in Europe. So travel companies, um, for better or worse, have, have responded to this in various ways. And I wonder if any of you would speak to the kinds of responses we've seen and, and from a brand perspective, a story perspective, you know, seeing the need to respond to this incredible, important thing that's happening, but but doing it in a way that feels authentic and genuine. I don't know if anyone wants to start yeah, on that. I'll start with that. <laughs> I think what's going on that I've seen a lot of brands do is some of them have actually come out and said, you know what, we've done, we haven't done enough. Mm -hmm. And, you know, kind of going back to my point about just being honest, transparent and vulnerable, mm -hmm. that is always the best way to go as a company. Instead of saying, just showing all your numbers or saying, well, we just, we've got, you know, 20%, we've got that, but just coming up and saying, you know what, we could be better, we could do this better. And so I think the travel industry has a long way to go, just in terms of diversifying and being more inclusive. And mm -hmm. what makes the travel industry kind of unique is because it's an industry that does try to promote being open-minded, you know, mm -hmm. and exploring the world, because the more you explore the world, the, the, the wider your perspective is. So I think the, the travel industry still has a long way to go, but it mm -hmm. starts with being completely honest mm -hmm. and acknowledging, fully acknowledging that there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally agree. I think we Intrepid, you might know, is um, the largest travel B Corp. The reason why we entered this certification in 2017 is because we knew we were doing a lot of great things, but we didn't really know what else we could do. And we really wanted to set a framework for us to improve everything really we do that touch any stakeholders and the environment, uh, gender, uh, inclusion, and every everything that really uh, touch our business. I think what is um, really important for business, as you said, is honesty and, and not to be afraid to take a stance and to say, um, we do stand with this and we do stand with that. So it can be the Black Lives Matter and it can follow with concrete actions of, you know, we stand for it and this is what we want to do. But in general, it can be for really anything that doesn't talk to our brand values. So, for example, in 2016, where we decided to stop riding elephants uh, in Thailand, we were the only one. And it looked like a crazy idea because people and companies were making a lot of money of riding elephants. But we decided to step, take a stance and we decided to take the risk to lose customers. But in the end, we actually gained more customers and more loyal customers. And when we do take a stance with the Black Lives Matter, we know that we're not perfect and we know that we're not doing everything as you, we don't have the representations maybe that we should have and we don't have maybe the training tools and we probably don't have uh, all our marketings reflecting exactly what it should reflect in terms of who are our customers, but we want to take a stance and we want to improve and this is how we start to improve is by really deciding that we ally uh, with the cause. And that's really touching every, every type of social matter, not just this one, I want to say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great, thank you for those um, those answers. I, we spoke, another storyline that's happening, another one, um, is that as Europe starts to reopen, um, you know, this, this idea of, of borders is coming back in Europe. And for Europeans, this is as much a practical question as an, as an identity-based question. Um, so, you know, it, it, in some ways, it's early days, and in some ways, these these measures are have been practical on on the part of member states, and of course, the European Commission would rather it be a more cohesive response. But as we move forward, um, you know, there is this concern that that this reemergence of borders might lead to sort of protectionism, nationalism. What role does travel companies storytelling play in sort of countering that? Oh. <laughs> taking taking us on and um, yeah um i think telling like when you're using storytelling to kind of build your own uh, identity you also use a lot of uh, like emotions so you connect on an emotional level with your readers or viewers and and it also it, i think it leads to more like you have a, a con connection on an emotional level with um another country or another region or your own place um, even before you've you've uh, visited like during the storytelling process you, you develop these kind of uh, connections 
Um, so, but the, the thing that could be really tough now is that if we are too strong in telling our own domestic story to our own people, that uh, we will build uh, our own nationality like in, in a stronger way than it's been intended to be. Mm -hmm. And so we have to also tell the like the story of solidarity, the story of, uh, of um, standing together, mm -hmm. um, not just being protective. Um, but but I, I do know that, that there's also like in the, in the media now, there's, um, there's also a story about people being afraid. And, uh, you know, we, we're coming back to the shaming part of, uh, of the COVID story. So uh, in the beginning, like people were, were yelled at going to work because people are like, oh, you're not, you're like, you're, you're not uh, doing uh, the, the lockdown in the correct way or you're, you've been walking your dog twice this day and you're only supposed to do it once. And so there's a lot of shaming. Mm -hmm. And I think we're coming back to that stage now because mm -hmm. uh, some countries have a lot of but there's still a lot of, uh, of infection in the, in the society and people are afraid and they're afraid of their loved ones and they're afraid of getting infected and, and they're afraid of, uh, of uh, losing their job and going on lockdown again. So sometimes uh, traveling internationally now, even though it's, it's allowed between neighboring countries, people are seen as, as uh, violating the rules, mm -hmm. uh, even though you're not. But you're not doing like, it's not, Socially accepted in the same way as it as, as it used to be, so now you can't really brag like, wow, like look, I'm in India, and uh, it's like everybody would just like, whoa, <laughs> uh, stay at home, don't yeah. spread. Yeah, so it's 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 the opposite of. It was also like I said before, like it's timing of how you how you tell your story. And so if you if you were telling like to three weeks ago that you were in a different country, people would look at you and just like you're crazy and you're putting us all at risk. Mm -hmm. um, but it's starting to soften up now. But I think it's still like a fine balance of, of how to tell that that story so you don't turn into a um, nationalistic um, mm -hmm. society again. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have something to add on, on that? Yeah, yeah, because it's <laughs> definitely sufficient. It strikes me that um, I had this thought when you were speaking, which is like, it's like saying, go out and have fun, but not too much. Yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah, finding yeah. that line and that line of, of appropriate uh, behavior, which changes almost every two days right now, mm -hmm. um, yeah. which is really remarkable. So I'm curious to think, I mean, there's something that's kind of been uh, underlying this, this conversation, which is that by broadening um, how we tell stories and who we reach, there's obviously a, a economic, a business benefit to that, which is sort of um, baffling why so much of the travel industry and industries in general um, uh, have failed to tap into that. I'm curious who you think the travel industry has been missing? Who have they been leaving out in the stories they've historically been telling um, that, that they should and can start to reach? Um, if I can, I think from our perspective, maybe there are two sides. Uh, one of the, the first the most obvious one is uh, obviously the travel industry maybe haven't been hasn't been as diverse in you know how they promote who are their travelers and if we want to broaden our audience uh, we need to be as diverse as possible as accessible uh, showing that really our to 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 the global to the to the whole world really and all all communities all backgrounds and um, and I think the other side is around the travelers and the, sorry not the travelers but the hosts and I think we're focusing a lot on markets, on travelers, and not enough on the host and the destinations in our marketing. Mm -hmm. and, and it's something that I, I do feel needs to change. And also when we talk at the moment about this crisis, about when we will be able to travel again, have we ever asked when are the destination be, will be able to also host you know, our travelers again? And mm -hmm. would they want to? Would they want to? Some of the most vulnerable communities might not want anymore this over tourism and this way of uh, you know travelers coming and and considering the the impact of the virus in these communities where healthcare is much lower and where and also we know the job supports the government supports have been absolutely you know around nothing in some of these destinations uh, are they ready to to start again and to rebound the same way than the western world wants and i think it's important that we take this perspective in, into account now in our marketing in how we promote travel and tourism moving forward 
Mm. I think also like um, it has been easier to tell like one story towards one market. But I think we need to kind of diverse uh, also the communication towards the families going on travels, and um, and we really need to to work on on um, expanding the seasons and have a more sustainable and responsible travel. And we can do that through through storytelling and kind of pinpoint the stories that we want to tell to each of the markets that we've um, we've been like wanting to reach. Like me and Lola has been working on this storytelling project with uh, a region between Sweden and, and Finland, the Quarken project. Um, and, uh, and like telling the stories about uh, traveling in this region towards a different audience mm. um, and, and telling it with a different voice than the locals would, yes. would do. So we're outsiders coming in, looking into the, the destination and, and seeing what what could we actually drag out of this, um, and and then then pinpoint it towards um, experiences that uh, different types of people would want to have. So it's not just the mass tourism market, like everybody should come here, but everybody should come but have unique experiences. And I think mm -hmm. that and also collaborating. I don't know, Lola, maybe you can yes, kind of yeah, uh, yeah, and I, and I just want to add, you know, it's. Um, all what Yannicka said, but also diversifying the storytellers as well, right? Mm -hmm. Because who gets to tell the story of the destination? And mm -hmm. if you think about the Nordics, right, there's always still the stereotype of who a Nordic traveler or a Nordic, you know, storyteller is. But mm -hmm. I'm here, I'm originally from Nigeria, but mm -hmm. yet with Yannicka, we're creating this Nordic TV. So diversifying the stories we can tell from different regions so that it reaches other people, so that it connects, it creates connections. Because what I connect with in a destination may be different than what Yannicka connects with, but it opens up that destination to the, to a wider audience. Absolutely. Okay, well, I think that's a, a great note to end this conversation on. I wanna thank you, all three of you, so much for being here and for your insights and knowledge. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Thanks for having us.